Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Atlantic Council, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here today. We've got a terrific crowd gathered for, I think, what's going to be an important conversation. Um, thanks for being here. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council. And it's my pleasure to kick off today's discussion from inside the Pentagon, the work of women and national security. We are delighted to be hosting this event and to be joined by a remarkable panel of national security leaders, including our very own senior fellow, Kathleen McGinnis, thank you for being here, and our very former uh, director of the Resilience Center's delight to welcome you back, Christine, Christine Warmoth. Um, Kathleen's today officially launching uh, her new book, The Heart of War, Misadventures in the Pentagon. It's a novel based on personal experiences, tackling strategic challenges and internal dynamics at the Pentagon. And it's a fascinating story that gets to the heart of some of the key issues that we'll be discussing. Um, Kathleen, we commend you for elevating and adding to the stories of women working in defense, sometimes with a bit of humor. Um, and there are copies of Heart of War in the lobby. We're gonna encourage all of you to pick them up while you're here this evening. Um, so I wanna thank all of our speakers for, for being here and thank our team led by Clementine Starling for helping to make this happen. Uh, this conversation today takes uh, place against the backdrop. We've just come back from the UN General Assembly in New York. We have high drama here in Washington today at a time when the United States finds itself in an increasingly chaotic world and sometimes itself part of uh, generating some of that uncertainty and chaos. Um, the rules of warfare have evolved and changed increasingly uh, broadened abuse, economic pressure, irregular forms of warfare, disinformation to challenge the U.S. and its allies. The United States is facing a range of strategic challenges as we move from a focus on the war on terror to renewed emphasis on the return of great power conflict as outlined in the national security strategy. So how does the U.S. go about aligning its strategic priorities with this vision? What's the role of the Pentagon in this process and its team? And how do you match this vision to action? So it's against this backdrop that we have this remarkable group of an, of an all-female panel to have at, uh, this conversation, all of whom have served in the Pentagon to address the difficulties of developing strategic solutions to complex challenges. So I can think of a few better people than Christine Wormuth, Lauren Schulman, uh, and Kathleen McGinnis uh, to tackle these topics and draw on their experiences as women in the national security field. Uh, we have a fantastic moderator. I'm going to turn the podium, turn the mic over to Tom Shanker, the assistant Washington editor of the New York Times. Thank you for being with us, Tom. Uh, he's had a distinguished career, having spent many years reporting on security uh, and defense issues. Before joining the New York Times, Tom served for 13 years as a correspondent covering the Pentagon. Uh, he has his own New York Times bestseller, has traveled extensively reporting from Afghanistan to Iraq, Moscow to Berlin, and his, his long career, he's covered wars in the, former so Soviet, in the former Yugoslavia, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, uh, and for the war in Afghanistan, Tom embedded with the Army Special Forces in Kandahar. So it's excellent to have you as a moderator for today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and invite the panelists to the stage. I'm going to encourage everybody who's following this either in the room or online to, to follow this conversation on Twitter uh, using the hashtag Women in Nat Security, Women in National Security, Women in Nat Security, and, ha and Heart of War. So once again, thanks for all, all of you for being with us. Um, we're gonna have a terrific conversation. Let me invite all of you to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's a great honor for me to be asked to be moderator. Uh, it's an important theme uh, coming at a time when I don't think it's an understatement or overstatement to say we are at a turning point in questions of both national security and about gender. A couple of things, if you'd all silence your cell phones. I know you've probably thought about that, but please, please do. Um, today we're gonna be discussing some traditional and some non-traditional 
issues. Uh, sure, we hope to cover some traditional things like Pentagon reform, civil relations, strategic priorities, shifting the global security environment, but we hope to bring in some less traditional topics, questions of how and whether being a woman in this field has affected their lives and has affected your lives. Um, the format today, I'll introduce each of the guests. They'll each speak for three or four or five minutes to sort of share their thinking, prepare the battlefield if you want to use that metaphor, uh, and then we'll move into a couple of questions. Normally these sessions have a very long moderated section. It's going to be very, very short because with a crowd this size and this motivated, I want to get to your questions very, very quickly. Um, one small thing, the panelists are on a timetable. Uh, the session will end at 5.30. I spent 10 years behind the Iron Curtain. I run these meetings with Stalinist efficiency. <laughs> we will be done at 5.30 sharp, thank you. Um, so the panelists of course we're introduced but a little more about them to my immediate left is Kathleen McGinnis she's currently international security analyst at the Congressional Research Service uh, one of her predecessors and a dear friend of mine is in, in the audience today as well I traveled uh, throughout the CENTCOM AOR with Kathleen when she was at the Pentagon doing NATO and um, Afghan policy uh, Christine Wormuth is next to her she currently is director and senior fellow of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at RAND at the Pentagon she served in what I think is probably one of the best jobs in government under Secretary of Defense for Policy. And next to her is Lauren DeYoung Schulman. She currently is Deputy Director of Studies and the Leon E. Panetta Senior Fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Among her government positions, she was a senior advisor on the National Security Council. So again, I can't imagine three smarter, more experienced people to discuss these topics. And with that, I'll turn it over to each of them. Kathleen, please. Oh, thank you for moderating this discussion, and thank you to the Atlanta Council and to Clementine and for Damon for having us here for this conversation. Uh, it's just extraordinary to be here. Um, I thought I'd spend a couple minutes this afternoon talking a bit about the novel, what, what inspired me to write it, um, and w what the experience of writing it did for me as an analyst, and, and some of the themes that really resonated with me as I, as I um, put the pages together, and, and this, this thing became, you know, took on a life of its own. Um, so what inspired me to write it? Um, I, this is, I think, a trip that you were on um, in Afghanistan, and we were flying from, Kab I think it was Wardak province, to uh, Kabul, and I was invited by one of the sergeants. Um, we were flying in a Chinook, um, and the, the sergeant invited me to sit off the back of the ramp because they opened up the ramp so you can sort of see the landscape behind you, and I was like, yeah, that'll be great. I love taking pictures. I, you know, I'll just be able to sit there, get a great view, fantastic. And I got myself seated, I got a little canvas harmonist around me, my helmet's on me, and I sit down, and I was freaking terrified. I mean, it's because you're there, I mean, like there was nothing between me and Kabul, but you know, a bunch of air and my boots, and there's a chase helicopter, oh, by the way, there's a gunner right next to me, sort of like making sure that anything that's targeting our helicopter might, you know, um, not be neutralized as a threat. And I was utterly petrified, and with my white knuckle grip on the helicopter, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting to tell the story of how somebody like me, a 28-year-old woman who hadn't served in the military but had been working around the military establishment for all my career, how would somebody like me end up in this kind of uh, situation? Um, I, I initially thought it would just be a series of rec recollections and reflections and it would be more nonfiction kind of account, but as I started getting into the process of writing it and, and and I realized you know after I left the Pentagon everybody asked me what it was like is it are you like Carrie from Homeland I was like no 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 not at all as a matter of fact completely the opposite <laughs> and so you know I decided that actually what there's a story here that has to be told and a story that will allow people to walk through what it's like what is what does the floor feel like what does it feel like you know to the the, the um, the Berber carpet, or the, the well, the industrial carpet, not Berber. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> more, much more fancy. Um, what you know? What does it feel like to be in the room where, at the time, there weren't all that many women, and certainly not on a war desk like I was, because I, I was a director for NATO's operations in Afghanistan. So, you know, how, helping people walk through what it was like um, really lent itself to fiction and storytelling. Um, and what surprised me as I went through the process, as I went through you know, f building characters and building narrative arcs and building the structure, I realized that it actually helped me be a better analyst. Um, it helped me contemplate what 
we were doing in the national security world and how we're organized in the Pentagon in a, in a different way. Um, there's an academic, Charles Hill at Yale, who, who he's written this wonderful book, uh, Grand Strategies, Literature, Statecraft, and World Order. And he invites people to take a look at fiction and storytelling as a creative, methodologically unbound way to analyze the world. And it seemed to me that, you know, that was certainly my experience and my takeaway of, of you know, expressing the Pentagon in a creative way. I, I was able to think about things like, are we designed right for national security? You know, is this really the way, the most effective way to be doing business? Or might we be considering a different uh, way to structure ourselves? Um, do we have the right human capital management? Really? Um, we tend to peop treat our people as interchangeable widgets, I, you know, in, in my view. Um, where, you know, a subject matter expert on North Korea can be plugged onto an Africa desk the next day and it'd all be fine. Is that really the right way that we should be doing things? So again, it invited me to uh, consider these kinds of um, questions in, an, uh, in a creative, again, me methodologically unbound way. Um, and it also invited me to reflect on what it's like um, as, as a woman in these institutions and what are the, the similarities and differences between the experience of being a woman and a man. And of course, I can only speak to what it was like as being a woman because, well, um, uh, but it, it seemed to me that um, finding one's authentic self and finding one's authentic voice is, is kind of challenging for women. Um, the, because the, the institution, the culture of the Pentagon is such that it's very rigid. Um, in my view, uh, the, the culture of the Pentagon is, you know, it takes its roots from the military services, which has been male dominated forever. Um, and so the, the Department of Defense itself, which sits on top of that, you know, um, also has a lot of masculine male characteristics, I, I think. And, and by that, I mean, you know, stoicism is prioritized. And if, if you're going to be emotional, often the, the appropriate reaction is anger. Let's go to the ladies' room. Or, or yeah, <laughs> or yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> go to the ladies' room. You can't, you know, so finding one's authentic self in that environment is, can be quite challenging. But once one does, once, once you can, it, it's an incredibly rewarding experience and it's an incredibly rewarding place to, to work. Um, but yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. Looking forward to your question. Christine, please. As I was sitting here, I was reflecting on the fact um, Kathleen and I have known each other for a while, but we happened to be together on a trip to Lithuania, I think more than two years ago probably, that was actually um, a, a part of a project here at the Atlantic Council. And it was towards the end of our, of our visit, and uh, I think you probably got a text message or an email or something, and I, you know, she got this very happy look on her face, and I said, Kathleen, what's up? And she said, I just found out from my agent that my book has gotten you know, a contract. <laughs> so it's really great to hear you um, talk about sort of how the whole thing came into being, and congratulations. What, what an accomplishment. Um, I think, you know, we probably all have our helicopter stories. I also was reminded listening to Kathleen, I think my very first time on a helicopter, I was actually in Romania and was on a Romanian helicopter when Romania was um, seeking to join the NATO alliance way back in the late 90s. And then um, I had a similar experience to the one you talked about in 2000. Seven, I believe I was on um, a congressional commission to, to look at the Iraqi security forces, essentially to sort of investigate and assess how well we were doing in building the capacity of the Iraqi security forces. So I went over uh, with a bunch of commissioners and it was July of 2007. It was literally 140 degrees. And uh, we had all gone up to the, the north of Iraq on a G5, but it was so hot that literally I'm not a pilot, but they couldn't bring all of us who went up back on the same plane because of the weather conditions and the fuel issues. So I wound up with a couple of guys going back on a basically just kind of catching a space on a helicopter. And uh, I remember it was nine o'clock at night. It was pitch black. You know, I had all the gear on. Again, the door was open. It was like being inside of a hair dryer. You know, it was just unbelievable. I actually had my sunglasses on at night just to try to protect my eyes from all of the sand. And it was late and I was kind of dozing off a little bit and all of a sudden I heard gunfire and I was like, oh my God, they're shooting at us. <laughs> you know, but I was like trying to keep it cool because I like didn't want to, you know. 
And when we landed and got back and I was able to talk to one of my colleagues who was a member of the military, he said, oh, no, no, it's just kind of standard operating procedure that when when they fly over the canals, the gunners, you know, clear their weapons or something. So basically everyone on the helicopter knew, except me, that this was completely <laughs> normal and I saw my life flashing before my eyes. Um, so yeah, you wind up doing things you never expected. Um, I, I guess I would just offer having having spent a lot of time in government as a as a career civil servant and then also as a political appointee. One of the things that I worry about now in particular um, is how difficult it is, uh, I found throughout all of my different jobs, to um, give the future a seat at the table and to really do strategic planning and strategic thinking. Um, and this, you know, we have the National Security Council, as Lauren knows, has a whole directorate focused on strategic planning. In OSD, we have a, um, a big office that has a lot of strategic planning responsibilities. The State Department has a policy planning shop. But in my experience, I found almost inevitably the crisis of the moment tends to crowd out the space to think about the big issues. And you know, from where I sit now as a country, I feel like we are, we're at a moment in time where the um, support and consensus around the value of the international order feels incredibly brittle and fragile. Uh, we, we, we really need, I think, to think deeply about how to revitalize the international order, how to reframe or, you know, reform. Do we need new institutions? Do we need to make changes to institutions and norms? We are, we are entering a period of renewed strategic competition with Russia and China. These are, and I think something that gets even less, you know, we talk now a lot about Russia and China, but something we're not even talking very much about is artificial intelligence and the implications that it has uh, for national security, but frankly, just for our society and the world writ large. Henry Kissinger did a piece uh, recently that I thought was very thoughtful, raising a lot of very big, philosophical questions about the implications of AI. And, and those issues, it's very hard when you're in government to grapple with those issues. The national security community does not do as good a job um, dealing with those issues as I think it needs to. So that, that's something I, you know, as I reflect on my time in government, that's a real problem that I see and I don't have a lot of answers for it. One, one thing I think gives me some hope is I do think there's a huge role for places like the Atlantic Council and CNAS and RAND and all of the think tanks around town. These institutions do have more space to think deeply about these kinds of issues. And I think we need to um, really find ways to build bridges between the think tank community and government. Um, but, but even with that, I think there's still major challenges. So I'd, I'd like to see some, some real progress be made in that regard. Thank and you. I think that's an issue whether you're a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lauren, please. So I, I also want to express congratulations to Kathleen. I uh, am so excited to have a book come out that talks about what is it like to be a human being and, and also a woman in the Pentagon in a place where people assume that it's full of faceless bureaucrats who are either only in it for themselves or are mostly former military or mostly military themselves. And to have somebody, to have a character walk around in the Pentagon in high heels that are red and have terrible weird stories happen to her is far more real to me than almost anything you see on television or on Jack Ryan or anything else. So thank you and congratulations. Um, I, I also have a helicopter story that links to my uh, the remarks that I wanted to make. Uh, that it was not my first time in a helicopter, but my first time in Afghanistan. I was also just terrified and trying to figure out how. Uh, you know, literally just panicking and shaking, trying to buckle myself in, having no idea what I was doing. And the special operations, um, I guess it was an officer actually was sitting, sitting across from me just sort of watching very calmly and finally reaches over and basically manhandles me into my seat, buckles me in, pats me on the knee and then offers me some chewing tobacco. <laughs> 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 and it, it, I also had the, oh, okay, I'm not in Kansas <laughs> anymore, but tried very desperately to pretend the whole time as though I knew exactly what I was doing and I belonged. And, uh, and that to me is, is emblematic of something we don't talk a lot about in the national security field, that we are all spending a lot of time walking around as though we know exactly what we're doing and we know our field very well and we know our roles and how to make decisions. And frankly, we don't. Um, 
any role that somebody goes in from the Secretary of Defense down to the lowest action officer on the Afghanistan desk, they've never done that job before. They're walking in completely unprepared, no matter how much schooling they've had or what amazing jobs they had before. And there is no training or anything that can teach them how to do that. And when they walk into those roles, it's not as though the world says, oh, we're just going to let you have some training wheels and it, we'll back off for a little while while you figure out what you're doing and also what your counterparts are doing too because that's a whole other can of worms. There's nothing like that. You walk, walk in on the first day and you might have had a transition, maybe a giant binder that you had to read. But frankly, you're supposed to know exactly what you're doing on that first day. And uh, as much as I, in my day-to-day -day work, rely on this, the, the absolute necessity of process in national security, it really comes down to the humanity of those individuals and the relationships that they have with their peers. Uh, any number of incidents when I worked in the National Security Council were very, uh, could have come out very differently if people had had the same understanding of vocabulary. Words like risk mean something very different to General Martin Dempsey than it did to Susan Rice, than it did to President Obama or anyone else. These conversations where they all thought they were saying the same things and they were violently disagreeing and it was just sort of fun but also really horrifying to watch at the same time and he wanted to have like a footnote go over like no you mean that no you mean that um, and over time these uh, these groups build up those close relationships and figure out how to be on the same page and how to talk in the same language but it takes a while and it takes a president who is willing to build a team up front and prioritizes that team up front as well as individuals that recognize they're not competing they're supposed to be working together for the, the good of national security and also just to have fun at the end of the day you're spending 18 hours a day anyway you might as well have some enjoyment out of it um, but I am very excited to be here tonight talking about what it's like to actually work in national security as a field and not just think of it as something you do in Tom Clancy books uh, is a, a real opportunity and I'm grateful to be here. Well, thanks to all three of you. That's a great way to start the discussion. So I was reflecting on questions. I, I thought, you know, the everything important I know in life I've learned from basically three sources. My wife, Johnny Cash lyrics, and the uniformed military. Um, and, and so my, my question comes from the third, because one thing I really respect about the military is their discipline in lessons learned after action reviews. No event goes unanalyzed. So I'd like to ask each of you to give me an AAR on an important project or policy or experience you had whether you succeeded or stumbled and why, and because of the theme of the day, did gender play a role, either yours or the, or the men that you were working with? Please. You know, I th the, um, the experience that immediately springs to mind, and one of the ones that was really quite formative for me as a professional was um, working on a civilian military planning cell for Regional Command South. Mm -hmm. um, there, so at the time, um, I was working in European and NATO policy, and um, I was one of the action officer that was responsible for the southern Afghanistan region. And so there's a bunch of different countries that were contributing forces to um, the operation in, Af in southern Afghanistan. And we would meet on a periodic basis about um, you know, what are the different issues, the, the unique issues of the south. Because um, the, the counterinsurgency was a real thing down there in a way that it wasn't quite the same in the north. Or the, or the East. And so the, the ministers of defense, the, um, the uh, secretaries of state would meet their counterparts in the, at the time there were eight ministers. But it turned out over time that Secretary Gates, he's, he was a man of action. He wanted things done. And so after a number of these meetings where they sort of compared notes and, and about what things were like in Southern Afghanistan, um, he wanted something to do. Like, but, but, okay, so how do we start fixing these things? And um, I happened to be stuck writing the briefing book at that time. <laughs> and so um, the boss turns to me, and not, not uh, Secretary Gates, but uh, lower down the chain, um, he turns to me and says, well, so w what do we do? And again, I'm, I'm 28, right? Um, and I blinked, and I was like, wait, me? And then, then I f first thought, well, maybe we should task out a study or somebody, like, we, no, no, we want to do something now. Okay, and I happen to have worked in uh, the Office of Stability Operations Capabilities, and one of the big takeaways from that experience was that the process of planning is often more important than the plan. That bringing together people in the room, helping them, um, giving them the space to compare notes and thinking about things, um, uh, problems in a shared way, um, is 
so important and that can have downstream effects. So it doesn't actually necessarily matter what the actual product is. It's those human relationships that you build in that, that kind of environment that can be um, enormously valuable, especially in a multinational context, especially when you're talking about bringing civilian and military instruments of national power together. And um, you might be able to tell from reading the book, sometimes we have a hard time with the left hand and the right hand, you know, understanding what the other's doing. Um, so yeah, so I suggested we do a planning cell, and then a couple months later, I ended up in Kandahar, <laughs> setting that up, um, and it was an enormous bureaucratic struggle to, just to get into the country, to allow the State Department to, to give me country clearance into the country, um, to to make this thing happen, um, and then getting the allies to sign up to it was also an, an interesting struggle as well, um, because it was something new and something unique, and and people were sort of like, what were we doing? Um, but in retrospect, um, it was almost behind its time because it was just before the uh, United States surged into southern Afghanistan. And so suddenly there was this cell that existed, but the United States sort of, you know, came in on top of that and all of those sorts of efforts were not, um, maybe not as important as what was going on in the United States and how that that relationship worked. So um, uh, I, I wish the timing had been a bit different, but um, but equally, um, got to start somewhere. Right. It, it sounds like you had learned, there's a line attributed to Eisenhower before the D-Day invasion, in which he said, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. everything. Exactly. Right. But uh, the question of gender, um, I, I don't, in that particular instance, um, I think being a young woman at the time, especially in a NATO context, I remember going to a NATO meeting at one point and, and a Greek admiral turned to me and was like, what are you doing as a woman in national security? Like, why are you doing, why are you here? You're, like, You're a woman. And I was like, because I'm the expert on <laughs> you know, NATO's operations in Afghanistan. So um, getting allied buy-in at that point, I think was a bit difficult at the time because I was a young woman. Um, but equally, we got there, mm -hmm. so. Great, Christine. Um, one of the biggest things that I worked on, uh, right as I um, was confirmed as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, I think right, right before I was officially confirmed, was when uh, ISIS essentially sort of you know rolled out of Syria into Iraq and almost took Baghdad. So pretty much from my first day on the job, I spent a lot of time working on the counter, we, we called it counter ISIL campaign. Now I, it's the, well, it's pretty much done happily, but the ISIS campaign. So that, that was a huge project for me that I really sort of was able to see from, from the beginning. Um, it was by no means, you know, it, it, its success has many fathers and mothers, so I absolutely was just one player among many. Um, but but it, was, it was fascinating to see how we as a government first put together sort of a, an interagency approach to trying to defeat ISIS and then um, rapidly move to essentially making it into, you know, a multinational coalition. Uh, with countries from the Middle East participating, with many of our European allies participating. Um, and and it, it was very interesting to be able to see how, and again, the timelines are a little bit fuzzy in my mind, but you know, we started the campaign essentially largely as an air campaign and it started to become apparent relatively quickly that an air campaign alone was not really going to work and that all of the work we had done for many years working with the Iraqi security forces, a lot of that training seemed to have been uh, very, very degraded and they, we needed to have some sort of a ground component. So um, it was very interesting to work together with the, with the different parts of the Pentagon, uh, with Central Command, uh, with our folks on the ground and the embassy team in Iraq to figure out how can we intensify this campaign. Um, and really, you know, start bringing much more momentum and start bringing the fight to ISIS. And, and you know, at that time we brought in John Allen, who was the special envoy for the coalition, uh, and we really started, and we, we set up a whole new command structure in Iraq and kind of went back into the country in a much more significant way. Um, so, you know, that, that was, I think, the, the two reflections I would make in terms of sort of an after action report or lessons learned was that um, we, prob we, we probably needed to start asking hard questions earlier about whether our approach was working, 
But we did start asking those questions fairly quickly, and we did, I think, take a lot of lessons from our previous experience in Iraq. We recognized that this was a case where, while it might take us longer to work with Iraqi forces and Kurdish Peshmerga, if we were going to have a solution that was going to have staying power on the ground in Iraq and Syria and in the broader Middle East, we really needed to have the people who lived there um, be organic to the solution. You know, they, we, we really needed to work by, with, and through local security forces. And, you know, as opposed to trying to do it all ourselves, which is what we did, obviously, in the early 2000s. Um, and, and it was interesting to see, you know, how in many cases, because so many, particularly in our military, the senior officer corps, many of them had had, you know, many tours in Iraq. Um, they, they had much more familiarity with the terrain, with the leaders, and I think, you know, saw much more quickly that we needed to have a by, with, and through approach. Um, from a gender standpoint, I think something, two things helped me. Um, I think one of the things that I was able to do as undersecretary that was useful to the process was because I had worked as a senior director at the National Security Council, I had a lot of relationships to Lauren's very good point about the importance of individuals and sort of human um, chemistry. I was able to perform sort of a translation function between the Department of Defense and the White House that I think really was necessary. Um, and also, you know, get, uh, uh, in the main, I am of the view that women don't bring sort of, you know, intrinsic goodness to national security by virtue of being women. I mean, I certainly think that there is intrinsic value to having a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds and experiences. Um, but I do think our society raises women to be largely, you know, to be more nurturing and more concerned about human relationships and more attentive often to human relationships than men. And um, because of that, I think I was able to be sort of a broker. You know, you can imagine there were a lot of um, big personalities, shall we say, with these three and four star generals and secretaries of defenses and deputy national security advisors and others. And I think something I was able to do by virtue of being a woman was kind of help navigate those relationships and build consensus and build coalitions and be someone that people could vent to. Um, in a way that I think benefited the process. So when I look at it, that's my kind of small contribution as a woman to the counter ISIL campaign. That's great, thank you. Uh, so I love this question on lessons learned. I do think the military does a good job at tactical lessons learned, but I think that they are utter failures on the more operational and strategic questions. And we as a national security community have like not even let that term enter into our vocabulary. We don't talk about political military lessons learned nearly often enough. Uh, so it's good that I have one of the biggest political military failures on my resume very prominently. Um, <laughs> I completely by accident um, started out in February of 2011 as the lead action officer or lead director on the Libya desk at the National Security Council. Christine was my boss, so I will only blame this on myself and not Christine. Um, but there, there are 30 lessons you could take from Libya of where we failed as a country, as a National Security Council, and uh, in individual agencies. I'll bring up two that have a couple of gendered elements to me that I'll mention. Uh, one is that the going into Libya, uh, the, the mission that we agreed with the United Nations uh, and that we agreed as the United States was uh, one of the pro most prominent pieces of it was civilian protection. That is not a military operation. Uh, so talking about what does that actually mean in practice requires a lot of very iterative discussion of, so is this civilian protection, is this not, is this trying to actually do something else, but we're calling it civilian protection because we want to do that? It requires a lot of debate, and that's incredibly uncomfortable, frankly, for a lot of military planners. The second element that I think re, re demands some lesson learned focus is a, a, a desire by the United States to not repeat Iraq. The number of times I heard in Libya planning, do not make this a repeat of Iraq. We do not want to go in as a stabilization force. We do not want to be involved in reconstruction. We will leave this to the Europeans and they will solve it all. Um, and we'll not, d we don't even want to talk about that as the United States. The gendered elements to me of this were, uh, multiple. Um, one, that the prominent advocates for action in Libya were Ambassador Susan Rice, um, Samantha Power, and Secretary Hillary Clinton. 
And it was very noticeable in the room that they were the ones pushing for this as against a, a, a you know, ma mostly male national security establishment that both didn't really want to do it and when ultimately the president decided to do so, were highly resentful of the decision and frankly continued to not want to do it even as they did. Um, and you, you felt that in the, the lack of desire to keep talking about what happens next, you know, where do we go from here? And I think that, that tension really fed a lot of the, the, the absence of post-conflict planning. The second piece of this is that, that necessity for iteration, that back and forth of like, what do we mean by civilian protection? What do we mean by, we're not using military power to bring down Gaddafi, we're only using political and economic power. A lot of the times when you ask a question from the National Security Council, particularly when you ask it as a woman or as a civilian, you get told that you're micromanaging. And the number of times I kept thinking, do you think I'm micromanaging or do you think I'm nagging? Because those are not the same thing. And I, I feel as though a lot of the time when questions were being asked by a woman at the table, it was less of a, was perceived by many as less of a thoughtful and useful question, and, or maybe even useful suggestion, and more of a micromanaging, uh, uh, inappropriate uh, discussion of how the military should be using its power. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people would have different interpretations of that, but the, the gendered elements of that discussion really, after years later, really, really got to me. And would, I would want to go back and handle a lot of those, force a lot of those conversations quite differently. Not necessarily saying like, hey, I think you're kind of being a little misogynist in this, but more just forcing conversations that were really uncomfortable at the time. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, just one more question from the chair before I invite the audience to join us. Um, Kathleen's book opens with her protagonist coming to the Pentagon her first day, full of doubts, concerns, wonder. I was wondering if each of you could take yourself aside your first day walking through the Pentagon or walking the NSC, what advice would you give her that you've learned now that your early career self should hear? I think I would, you know, picking up on Lauren's point, um, that the Pentagon is a human place. Mm -hmm. um, that that your counterparts, in building relationships with your counterparts, um, building trust amongst your counterparts is critically important to getting the mission done. Um, and to, you know, building empathy with each other is also incredibly important to getting things done. Um, it's the, the, the Pentagon itself is designed for debate. Right? You've got different offices and institutions battling for different policy outcomes based on their different um, organizational bureaucratic points of view. So building bridges and empathy across these um, the organizations is absolutely essential. And that's, that is definitely what I would hammer home with my, myself when I, um, if I could, if I could take, take myself aside. I would, I would give myself two pieces of advice. Um, one I followed, but, and one I did not. Um, the, the, the advice that I followed, that I always give to people now, is know your stuff, you know, build expertise. Uh, it is challenging because there is kind of an approach where you know, you're at the North Korea desk for two years, and then you're, next thing you know, you know, you're on the Chad desk. Um, but, but particularly as a civilian, and particularly as a woman, it's very, very important to learn your issue area, develop expertise, and, and ground yourself in that expertise, and then often, you know, success will follow that. Um, the other piece of advice I would give myself looking back is worry a lot less about what people think about you and whether they like you. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I too, like Lauren, it sounds like have, you know, incidences that I th think back on and I think I wish I'd handled that differently. I wish I'd spoken up more. I wish I'd, I wish I'd you know, pushed a little harder. Uh, and a lot of times I didn't because I was worried that somebody wasn't going to like me. Um, and that was misplaced. A lot of wasted energy. Building on that point, uh, I, the advice that I give right now is don't be afraid to stand out in the room, particularly as a woman. If you're a woman in the Pentagon, you're standing out a little bit anyway, and that's okay. Uh, so you'll, as I, I said this earlier, you'll notice I'm wearing bright red right now. Don't be afraid to wear bright red, turquoise, or whatever color that you want. You don't need to blend in in the Pentagon. Uh, and likewise, you don't need to worry about your opin opinions blending in. You don't have to agree with everyone all the time. If you want to stand up and make a point about this doesn't sound right to me, you are often the hero of that moment because everyone else in the room is thinking this doesn't sound right to me, but just as I actually <laughs> want to say it. So you don't have to take every moment, every opportunity to do that over and over again because that gets exhausting. 
but in the times when it really matters, you can stand out, be that little elephant or the, the elephant in the room that speaks up and says, hey, can we just take a pause and maybe think about this further? And people will really, really value that and they will think of you differently as a result. Thank you so much. Uh, I invite questions. If you'd wait for a microphone, please identify yourself and if uh, what organization you're with. And because there's so many people here, I'd love to have questions and not speeches. Who would like to go first? Dick, please. It's on. Uh, this, is a, this is probably a very basic question, but having been a national security type position myself and having worked with women and men alike, everybody's ambitious when you start out in your career. And you have a lot of competition if most of the career people have been male. What have you found is the most difficult way of getting your first set of views across and something significant so that you can be taken seriously as a woman and a specialist. Could you share with the audience who, who you are, sir? Some of us. Oh, know. I'm sorry. Uh, Dick Grimmett. I uh, used to be a senior national security specialist at the Congressional Research Service. I'm retired now. Thank you. Um, so, so what was, how did you establish your credibility? Is that the question? Um, and I think it, it goes to Christine's point. Um, know your brief. Know it in and out. Make sure that you can defend the points and just be, be ready, be tenacious. Um, sometimes, well, it's, it is a competitive town. There's, um, it's a competition for ideas all the time, but stick to your guns. Um, and again, know your brief. I think I would just add, um, I think that's the core, but if you have the opportunity to, to try to choose who you work for, that can be very important too. I was fortunate to have one of my first positions be in the Pentagon. Um, I worked for Michelle Flournoy, who was a boss who was willing to take risks and take risks on people and give junior people opportunities. And so, you know, particularly as I became a boss myself, I reflected back on on some of the things that she let me do. And I thought uh, she was probably terrified because you know <laughs> she, she let me do some pretty important briefings you know, when I still had training wheels on. Um, but so you know, if you can pick your boss, try to find bosses who have a track record of, of um, nurturing talent. Uh, be an exceptionally good writer. Uh, this is the, the one, uh, honestly, it's like the one thing that I'm good at. I, I, can, I can write extremely well. I can write the bottom, I, bottom line up front better than <laughs> many of my peers. And as a result, because of that, I was often chosen to write you know, whatever had to go forward, the memo, the summary, whatever happened. So those were from me. So that whatever piece of paper went up to the boss had my name on it. And as a result, they knew my name. They also knew that I could write. And the people who are surrounding uh, around me who didn't want to bother with writing the memo or maybe weren't as good as writers, they weren't well known and they didn't get the credit. So the, use my, my manipulative but also self-serving <laughs> advice of be a really good writer. That's great. Fast typing skills. Fast yeah. Really, yeah. Right. <laughs> getting a memo done under a crush. Yes, please. Here in front. There's a microphone coming. Thank you. So I, I come from abroad. I'm not from the States. Uh, my name is Danila. I'm the president of the Macedonian Chambers of Commerce. And uh, a lot of you, since you have a vast experience, know the country from one of the ex-Yugoslav republics. So uh, generally what my question is, as a country which is a NATO aspirant, and we are supposed to be the 30th country which will be in NATO probably soon enough, uh, I would like to ask a question if you're planning to broaden the radius into uh, giving us your um, inspiring stories. Since I have seen uh, your resumes and they're really, really uh, something you should be proud of, I think that maybe you should do an international career into raising awareness since you're three very prominent and <laughs> inspiring uh, ladies, and we don't see that much, especially in national security. So that would be my question. Do you plan on raising awareness internationally? Well, I mean, I think Kathleen is doing so with this book in a way that is far better than anything else that I could do. But I, I will, I will. Pit, yeah, I just showed myself to be self-serving and manipulative. So I'll go ahead and pitch one of most of my work. Um, <laughs> I, I, so one thing that I do in this field is I have a podcast uh, that is of only women, uh, three women, it's called Bombshell. Uh, we have only women hosts, we have only female guests, 
and we only talk about hardcore national security issues. We're not talking, but this is an important conversation, don't get me wrong, but we don't talk about what it's like to be a woman in the field. We are women in this field because that's normal. Uh, and in doing so, we are both trying to raise awareness that it's in, in no, both entirely normal, but also wonderful that women are such, such exceptionally talented parts of the national security world, but also to draw attention to their amazing work and hopefully to help build their careers and connectivity at the same time. Uh, and it's something that I encourage, to the extent that you can do things like that, where you can help raise awareness of your peers' wonderful talents and work and elevate them up on your shoulders as well, that's the best part of my day, is to be able to figure out ways to do that. So great, great question. If you want to sponsor me to go on a worldwide tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been to Macedonia, it's a right. great, you ought to go and visit. <laughs> but I mean, it does sort of get to one of the big reasons that I wrote this book in the first place. Um, I, I wanted to invite people outside of the Washington national security community into the experience of what it's like to formulate national security policy. And what are the trade-offs? What are the risks? And how can our best laid plans get thrown into the air? Uh, how do all these things happen? My, my, and it, so recalled in 2014, you know, Russia in, invaded and annexed Ukraine. Uh, Crimea and then the, the Ukrainian proxy war had started and th th we suddenly realized that the world was changing in profound ways. I mean there's a, and the national defense strategies have subsequently started recognizing that but when you actually look at the programs and the capabilities and what we are how we are interpreting that world well we're, we're going back to great power competition and we're doing so, that, okay, fine, but we're doing so in a way where we are prioritizing military capabilities and, and a rearmament, you know, European defense de and deterrence initiative, those sorts of activities. Not that those aren't important, but we've got adversaries who are doing things deliberately below the threshold of, you know, prompting a, a military response from the United States. It's, is, is this the right way to be doing business? Is this the really the right kinds of strategic priorities we should be having? And and getting that back to this question of you know how we're managing our people, we've got these long days. We're coming up with the same responses and the same answers to the, uh, an increasingly complex geopolitical environment, and expecting different results. And I wanted to invite the broader American public and the world into this conversation. Is is this really the right choice, or should we be thinking about ways to do things a little bit differently? And what could that look like? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I am Diane. I'm an intern at the French Embassy. And my question is about um, the ways we could increase the, um, the amount of women in jobs, like in the military and national security. Um, I was thinking especially about women quotas, and if you think there could be a way to do that, um, or if you have other, other ideas for how we could do that. Um, I'm really against quotas, <laughs> as as I as you might have inferred from my comment about you know I don't think there's anything sort of inherent in being a woman, um, but I do think there's huge value again in having a diversity of experiences. So rather than and one of the reasons I hate quotas is um, I think if you take that kind of approach, then you put women in positions where you have people around them scratching their head and saying, well, is the only reason they have that job because there's a quota. And I know, you know, I certainly didn't want people to be looking at me as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and thinking she only got that job because she was a woman. I wanted to have that job because I was qualified for that job and I was good at that job. Um, I think one of the biggest things we could do to, um, I mean, there are two things. I, th I think whether it's um, diversity of ethnicity, race, um, gender, you have to address it at the front end um, and try and put more people into the pipeline at the beginning. And so, you know, really encouraging women, for example, to get interested in national security issues in the beginning of college, uh, for example, I think is something that might help. But another structural thing that I really think would be great, and this is something where, you know, I think of the Europeans, I think are far ahead of us. When I look back on my career, I started when I was 26, and there were a good number of women, I would say, around me who were in my peer group. Um, but, uh, you know, and then when I looked around when I was 40, there were a whole lot less women. The, a lot of the women I started with weren't in the field anymore, and I started wondering about why is that. And my hypothesis is 
that a lot of times when women get to the point in their lives that they want to start having a family, if that's what they want to do, it's very hard to have these kinds of jobs and to pursue these kinds of careers the way the United States is structured, without decent maternity leave, without affordable childcare options, um, all of those things. And I think you know a lot of the women that started with me that didn't stay did so because they had to make different choices to have whatever work-life balance they wanted. So I'd like to see the society here in the United States make those kinds of changes. I think it would be beneficial for men and women, but I also think it would help get and keep more women in this field. I would like to see, um, is the, the Pentagon has done a lot of work to um, ch help change its culture uh, in terms of, you know, because the gender balance has been changing. And so, you know, we've got, uh, breast pump stations within the Pentagon. You've got, you've got some, you know, some changes, but it gets back to this question of really, are we still, are we yet allowed to be our authentic selves? Are we yet allowed to respond to different, you know, issues and, and um, challenges with, you know, the, the way we feel is appropriate um, or the, the way that makes sense to us? Um, it's, it's, if you're emotional, go to the bathroom, as you said earlier. You know, it's take it out of the room. Yeah, and and so you know, is that is that really the right way of doing business? Um, um, I I tend not to think so. I so I'd love to find ways within the culture to allow us to bring our authentic selves to the table because that's when the real like the the magic happens in policy when when you're allowed to to be yourself to think creatively to think dynamically and to 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 push things forward in 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 the service of the men and women downrange so one of my favorite lines that I, i've said this to her several times so i apologize for the repetition one of my favorite lines in kathleen's book is uh this point about how it is easier to move fifth fleet than it is to hire a civilian into the pentagon and that sounds exaggerated, I find it to be highly accurate. Um, so that in itself is a problem, that we have a hard time bringing in people overall. But when you start to look at the rules of how the Pentagon and other parts of the US government, and I'm sure this carries over to other governments as well, the rules about how and they bring on people and what kinds they can bring on. So for example, we give a, a preference to military veterans when hiring into jobs into the federal government, and there's good reasons we've chosen to do that. But the vast majority of folks who have served in the military are male, vast, vast majority. They also have fit certain um, economic and racial and ethnic profiles, and so you're, you're forcing yourself to pool from, or to look at this specific pool and give them a preference above people you might otherwise want to hire, such as women or such as specialists in certain kinds of languages or technical fields and things like that. So things like that that are exceptionally well inten uh, intentioned and should be you know, continued in some way create incentives for us to not be able to do the talent management that Kathleen has talked about so many times here that's really necessary for national security. Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry. Could you pass this? Thank you. Hi, Lara Seligman. I'm a reporter with Foreign Policy. Thanks you all for doing this. I've um, been having a lot of conversations recently about um, how the military is sort of falling behind in terms of keeping up with the modern idea of a family and families that today need two incomes uh, to be able to pay for things like childcare and families in which um, women want to be doctors and lawyers and uh, and as such you can't just move around with your husband when I pick up and move whenever he's deployed or women that are in the military who then have male spouses who similarly have those jobs so I'm wondering if you can address that and and say whether you believe that's the case and um, also address what you think the military should be doing about this I'll um, take a swing at that one I think, you know, A, it's, I think it's important to note that the military, I think, has actually made some significant strides in trying to deal with these issues. Um, and, but there's still a long way to go. Um, one, one thing I think that DOD has been looking at and um, thinks has potential but hasn't figured out exactly how to implement is the idea of sort of somehow creating more on-ramps and off-ramps for military service um, that would, you know, the way the military works now basically is, you know, you come in and there's sort of two gates 
um, I'll just focus on, I'm more familiar with the way it works for officers, but you know, you, you come in, there's sort of a gate at 10 years where a lot of folks make the decision about whether to stay in or leave. And then if you decide to stay in at 10, you're pretty much staying until you're 20 because that's when your retirement thing kicks in. Um, and, you know, and it's also a very much of an up or out promotion system. So the more senior you get, the more pressure there is that you get bumped out. And so um, they haven't, you know, they, they understand, I think, theoretically that they need to be able to provide pathways to let people go out and maybe, you know, get into civilian life and perhaps have a different pace so that they can have, you know, young children and then come back in when the kids are a little bit more grown. But, but actually figuring out how to do that, it's a lot, you know, the analog I always thought on the civilian side, if you will, is sort of like the partner track in a law firm. It's, you know, because they've done, there's been a lot of looking at this for women who want to be on the partner track. And the, the pushback is always, well, if we let her go out and have a family and do whatever, what about the people who are associates who stayed in all the meantime? If you let that person just come back in, then you're sort of disadvantaging the people who've stayed there and ground away all along. And, you know, and it's not obvious to me exactly what that solution is, but it probably could be found. And so I think more work needs to be done um, around that. I think one thing that makes it particularly complex for the military is the fact that it does involve moving around the world and forward deployments. And that, you know, it's unique. It's a unique profession in that way. Um, and so they've done a lot of work for to make credentialing easier for spouses so that people who are nurses and teachers can, you know, can take those credentials from Florida to Texas to New York. Um, it's still not as easy as it should be, but they've made progress there. But to some extent, you know, you can't get around if you're in the military that you're going to be moving all over the country, all over the world. Um, and so, you know, I think a, that lifestyle isn't for everyone. And some of that, I think, can't be kind of engineered out of it. I think just to build quickly on that, there, I think there are a couple of assumptions that the military has made and is now becoming very aware of those assumptions, which is good. The first one is, to Christine's point, they assume that it is good and useful for professional development to move from uh, job to job and location to location in order to grow you as, as in particular as an officer, but also as an enlisted in an NCO. I, I think that there are people who would challenge that and say that actually you are making it very difficult for them to grow in these roles by forcing them to do so in very different locations all the time. And there are careers that are good and valid that can be had that do not demand that. On top of which, it's incredibly expensive for us to be moving military families around the country at all points in time. Lots of GAO reports, highly recommended. <laughs> um, the second assumption they have made about what is necessary is um, the support of volunteer spouses. You, if you listen to senior military leaders, they talk all the time about how you know the commander spouse or the volunteer lead spouse or, or the, the spouse groups and things like that. And those serve really important roles in many communities. But it makes an assumption that there is a spouse that has the spare time to basically do a full-time job for no pay with also very little help, little help training or support from the local command and that that, it, that, that is required for this community to thrive uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Assuming that is frankly absurd today and as, as you point out in today's um, economic environment where you need two incomes and a lot of places to pay for, pay for child care on top of which you may just want a career. I think they have if you talk to senior leaders, they have realized they've made this assumption and they've realized that they need to start changing it, but it requires so many trickle-down changes all the way down to things you've not even thought about planning for that it's going to be difficult to alter. But people are raising their hands to say, "This is I am not able to serve in the military because my spouse cannot support this. Not because they're not afraid of me deploying, not because they are you know, sick of the uniform and all that kind of stuff. It's because they want to have their own life and that you need to be able to support that institution. Anecdotally, you hear the, the you know the strains that this this places on the families, right? Mm -hmm. You know, with multiple. I mean, we've been at war for 17 years, multiple deployments, and 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 families and spouses back home having to support that, and you know, the spouses get to their breaking points, and we've been seeing that um, anecdotally, and and I think there's some studies on it yeah. as well. So, um, so, and that has real implications for the health of the force and our ability to 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 fight, right? Because the, the labor of managing a home is done by the spouse that is uncommodified, like it's unpaid. Um, but if that's not okay, then the deployed service member can't focus on the mission. So it's, it's an assumption that's built into how we are actually fighting and winning or 
fighting our wars. <laughs> uh, that probably needs to be interrogated pretty, pretty rigorously. Hmm. Just a footnote to something Lauren said about the rapid rotation in the military. Um, Don Rumsfeld used to say, and it, I have to stop and say, just because Rumsfeld said it doesn't automatically make it wrong. Um, <laughs> he, he came from the corporate world and he objected to these two or three year flips. He said, you're just learning the job the first year. You're making a lot of mistakes the second year. You ought to stay around for two more years to fix your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to your next job. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. anybody in back? Uh, yes, please. And I'll go back to you next. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Taylor. I work with the Section 809 panel. I'll just make a pitch to say that in change management, we understand that for any major transformation to take place, it takes three to five years. So just leave that there. But um, my question for you three ladies is, what is your favorite or most effective mansplaining confrontation tip? Oh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I found it, I'm, you know, maybe it's because I'm getting older and crabbier. I, I, I am more inclined these days to just kind of interrupt and say, yes, I know because I was in Iraq, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, yes, I, I know that because I had a, you know, I spent four hours a day in the situation room for two years. Um, uh, but subtlety it doesn't really stop mansplaining I've found yeah, <laughs> yeah it's 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 a pretty direct engagement <laughs> I would say um, and you know and it's, it's 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 tricky right because on the one hand you have to be assertive clearly if you're being mansplained they're questioning your ability to, or your, your your credentials or your your the validity of validity of your viewpoint um, so you have to be assertive but again if you're if you're assertive then you're seen as tough it's and it, you start there's a negative connotation to that so it's tricky I'm now at the point where I'm I'm less concerned about the negative connotations you know what no I, I have earned my seat at the table. I have I have earned I've earned my place to be here, and I'm going to defend that. Don't don't try to suggest otherwise. Um, so my, mine is a tip on how, how not to handle <coughs> mansplaining, um, it, because I, I am I think amongst the three the most active on on social media, and I had a, an incident where somebody was challenging or was explaining an article I had written incorrectly. And, but they were doing so without realizing that they had copied me on the tweets. I'm not, God knows how they did that. But I, I responded with a fairly benign tweet just asking them if they, they realized that I was the writer. And somehow this, this caught on, and I said something snarky, I will admit. And I, somehow this just like caught on and received, I think, something like 200,000 retweets rather rapidly. And on top of which, lots and lots and lots of attacks against this guy who just didn't really know how to use social media. Um, so my, my lesson in that is that social media is actually a really bad place to think about mansplaining. You're, you're limited to 280 characters and you are absent context that people talking to you don't know anything about you, usually, even if they should, and they, you don't know anything about them. Uh, so that engaging on mansplaining debates on social media, it, as great as it feels for a little while, is not actually good for the overall sake of the argument. Uh, but in person, by all means, <laughs> exactly as they've said. But, but I would add, I guess um, it's been my observation that a lot of men don't actually know that they're doing it, right? And so um, trying to approach that as well, you know, as, as, as frustrating as it gets and you've got to fight your corner, on the other hand, having empathy with the with the understanding that this this stuff is so embedded in our cultures, right? Th these kinds of shifts are going to take a long time to address, and so recognizing that you know some of these men are on this journey with us, and and we're all sort of we've got to create a new culture, we've got to create a new understanding together. Um, I, I think is another important point. So the, the journalist to me really requires me to press all three of you to follow up on your great question, and it comes out of your book. Um, your book is full of men who don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but your book also has a couple of extremely sharply drawn women yes. who don't get it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Talk about those experiences, having a female. So, I mean, you mentioned Michelle, who all of us know and respect so much. So 
It's obviously not her. Um, <laughs> I don't want names. I don't want names. But talk about navigating your careers and heavy policy with a female boss who is not the supportive, nurturing type. Well, yeah, and, and I guess, it, and, it, and it, it, read the book. You will love those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. There's there's copies for sale. Um, no, I think. It's one of the reasons that I keep coming back to this question of organizational culture. Because if you're in this institution that is hyper-masculine, you know, by design, you know, it's the military service, that's, that's where DOD gets its cultural roots. And so as, as DOD has grown and the gender dynamics have changed, the, the, the culture hasn't. But what that means is that women in particular, I, I think, enter the, the Pentagon into a hyper-masculine culture where you're not allowed to be your authentic self. You're not, and again, you have to go to the bathroom. Okay. Um, and so there's a variety of different strategies that I think women employ when they're faced with that, right? On the one hand, there's the, okay, I'm gonna be even more masculine than, than the generals and I'm gonna eat them for breakfast and they're gonna take no crap and that's, that's it. And, and that, that is one strategy. There's another strategy where, you know, no, I'm going to, I'm going to be an insurgent on the inside and I'm going to build a sisterhood and, and we're going to support each other. And, and there's all kinds of different strategies in between and, and women find their ways in, in, in different aspects or find their own paths through that. Um, the point though is that if we don't allow women to be their authentic selves, if, we, if the culture doesn't change, if we don't take a close look at that, we're going to keep experiencing these things where we're, where we're not allowed to be ourselves and make better policy on behalf of the, of the nation. Christina? Yeah, I would, um, I agree with a lot of what Kathleen just said. I, when I, I went into the Pentagon when I was 26 years old, and there were a number of, a number of female deputy assistant secretaries and, and Michelle Flournoy was one of them, but there were others as well. And most of them were extremely sharp elbowed and, and difficult and hard to work with and hard to work for. And I remember thinking, you know, am I gonna have to turn into a wench essentially to be successful here? Um, certainly Michelle was a model of how not to do that. But I think a lot of the reason those women behaved that way is very much about what Kathleen's talking to. You know, there was a, I think they probably felt it was the only way they could survive and be successful in that environment. Um, and I'd like to think that um, those of us that have come since, you know, led by Michelle, but there are many others, tried to tried to model a different path and show that you could do it differently. Um, you know, I I am very well known in the Pentagon for my for my shoes that are and the fact that I wear high heels. And I actually got a text message from a former action officer of mine recently who was on a trip and she texted me and said, you know, a bunch of us were laughing and remembering about how, you know, when you went to Afghanistan you got out of the helicopter with your heels on. You know, and that's a small thing, but but it goes to that issue of be who you are. I think ma male or female, to be a good leader, you have to be who you really are. You know, I will never be Michelle Flournoy. There, you know, as much as I admire her, we have very different personalities and just trying to imitate her is not going to work because I'm not her. I have to be who I am. Now, I think you have to be, you know, there are, for now, I think there are limits to how authentic a place like the Pentagon is gonna let people be. So you have to sort of, you know, be, be yourself, be true to yourself, but be aware of the context and environment of which you're doing it. And, you know, if you're, if you're truly super authentic, you may not <laughs> do that well in a very conservative environment. Um, but, but my hope is that women now, you know, and it, I just thought I'd like, to, I'd like to go and see how the current crop of female DASDs, to the extent that there are any, Lauren and I were just talking about that, but, or, you know, office directors who are women, are they different? Are they doing it differently? And are they succeeding at doing it differently? I hope they are because I hope that they've had the opportunity to see that there's a different way. So every, every crazy doesn't get it boss I've ever had, men, men and women, have, has always had a, um, a, a whipping boy, a whisperer, a, a herald. Sometimes that was me. 
who was there to be the interpreter to to take the to both the, to take the bad news from the action officer into the crazy boss or vice versa to deliver the judgment from the crazy boss back to the people who actually had to implement it and and I I've served that role in a number of cases but I also know other people who serve that role and I, I remember originally thinking like this is just nuts like why don't you just like act like a normal person and like not have to interpret your your whatever is wrong with you through somebody else <laughs> um, but both of your points about like you sometimes like there's their incentives to be the crazy boss in a lot of different roles and sometimes it's it's just necessary to be able to channel that into find find somebody who trust trust you you trust who will go in and shut the door and be like okay that was crazy and you have to apologize and they'll listen to you uh, and then vice versa that they, they can scream at you and they'll be like whatever I'm just gonna roll my eyes and it's gonna be fine and those are not healthy relationships to talk about like to your psychologist or perhaps to your spouse but in these really high pressure environments they make sense for a brief period of time and also so long as you're able to recognize that like ultimately we're all in it for kind of the same reasons. Um, so like, you, may not, you may not be able to get rid of the crazy boss, but like, find the person who is their, their safety valve to make sure that you are not offending them too terribly. I promised a question here, ma'am. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Sharon Foster. I work for the National Guard Bureau. Uh, my background is communications. Actually, sir, you took my question, so I had to, <laughs> I had to sit here and think about something else. And um, thinking about current events, um, I'm thinking about the Me Too movement. I'm thinking um, being someone in the military, a soldier, a female soldier, being someone that's working around predominantly men. How do you think the Me Too movement has has it changed anything? Do you see within the military population that you work around or at the Pentagon or um, what are you, what are your thoughts about that, please? I, I'm sorry to give you that hard question, oh, but no, he took no, my, no, my I mean, question. Think, okay. You no, like hard questions. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. I, I mean, should say I like for them to have hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that um, for me personally, um, me too has you know, in addition to, you know, giving us a sense of community uh, that didn't previously exist. It's also, when you, when you start thinking about it a little, a little bit more, it's given us a grammar to start understanding when there's differences in treatment that, that didn't exist a couple years ago. That's extraordinary. Um, and so looking forward, you know, and especially in the light of today's events, um, we're going to have to figure out a new way forward together, um, men and women, and, and, and create, you know, what is, what is an appropriate culture? How, how do we m minimize these, these imbalances? How, you know, how do we identify these, these differences in treatment? Um, it's, again, it, I'm, I'm enormously grateful to this movement because it's given us a way to start talking about this. And I think we're at the very beginning of a conversation, a national conversation, and it's got to be both men and women. I think you know the military in a lot of ways is a you know it's a it's a slice of society it's a reflection a lot of the things that you see happening inside of the military as an institution are are a reflection of the dynamics that are happening in our broader society and so I think a lot of um, you know, Rand just put out, for example, a very big report on sexual assault at military installations. And there was a lot of, shall we say, back and forth between Rand and the Department of Defense about that report. It's a very sensitive subject for the Department of Defense. Um, but, you know, in my view, and I'm not a researcher on that area, so I don't have a lot of data and analysis, but the sexual violence that's happening inside of the military is is a lot like the sexual violence that's happening everywhere in, in our society. You know, look at what's happening on campuses and universities. My, I have twin daughters who are seniors in high school who are going to be going to college next year. And I talk with them sometimes about, you know, the kind of environment they're going to go in. And I don't want to teach them to be victims. I don't want to teach them to be afraid. But I want them to be smart. And right now, you know, you have to have those talks because we haven't finished the journey together to address those issues. But I really think it starts from the very beginning. I, you know, I, don't, I have girls. Lauren has boys. 
And you know, I, I think a huge part of what's needed is to how we raise our boys you know, to be the kinds of men that we want them to be for our daughters. Uh, and, that's, you know, and that's where we need to start. We're not, we, starting at the military isn't going to do it. As a, as a final point on that, both of those really great points, um, Kathleen talked about how it, it gave us a vocabulary. Amongst my, my very close friends, I have a lot of really close friends in the national security world, we did not talk about any of the issues related to the Me Too movement until it became something that you talked about, in, uh, until it became in the news. As close as we were, we talked about everything. And when it finally started, these incidents start becoming more public uh, and, and under public discussion, that's when I have email chains and text messages and happy hours, months of this, of like us all talking about when that happened, like I know you were like just down the hall, but I didn't tell you because I just thought this was something that we just absorbed. And it's now hit a point where like we're not absorbing it anymore. At minimum, we're talking about to each other about it, which has just been a just tr a tremendous relief I can't even describe. But also the fact that it is a public discussion, particularly women in national security as, a, as a, a Me Too component, there are podcasts about it, there's news articles about it. Susan Glasser has written about it very eloquently about how Me Too and national security have intertwined. This is something that is now a fact and not something that I hid. And that in itself has made a difference in terms of how I think about this going forward that is not a big policy change, but it made a big difference to me personally and I hope it can make a big, big difference to other people as well. Thanks. Um, before I invite our esteemed panelists to speak a moment or two in conclusion, I just want to say that there are really so many different ways to examine the, these issues. Uh, you know, the articles have been spoken about, the conversations, and every now and then a book comes along that really does blow the fog off the distant mountain of national security, and it's worth reading. And of course, I'm talking about The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, this is an original sign first edition. That's a joke, I'm not that, that old. But, but I'm also talking about The Heart of War, which is Kathleen's novel. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, there will be a wine reception afterward with copies of the book. Um, do yourself a favor, pick it up. Timesmen are not supposed to give book plugs, so that was off the record. But I will shamelessly say, nytimes.com, our at war blog this morning, has a lovely interview with Kathleen conducted by Lauren. And so since the New York Times has written about it, I think I can give it that kind of promotion. <laughs> um, special thanks to the Atlantic Council for hosting this very important event. And of course, to each of you for coming, your attention, your great questions. And now in conclusion, final comments. Uh, just uh, to thank you to the Atlantic Council and to come and to all of you for joining me up here and and helping me, you know, look at the world, look at the national security world, and and, and contemplate this world in, in a different way. Um, it's it's been an enormously rewarding experience to to write the book and and now that it's launched into the world and seeing how people react to it and the things that they can take away from it um, has is is just extraordinary. Um, so thank you all for, for uh, being here, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you in the reception. And um, it's, yeah, we, we, we're, coming, we're, we're making progress as women and as a community. And we've got a long way to go, but it's, it's enormously rewarding to be here as part of it. I would just say, as I look out at the audience, I see a lot of people, men and women, who are under 40. Uh, and I would just encourage you to stay in this field. You know, there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of obstacles. There are a lot of frustrations. It's a really hard time right now in this town. You know, a lot of people don't, government seems so dysfunctional. Um, but we need you, you know, no matter how you're, no matter how you're touching the national security community, please stay with it because we really need you. So one of the questions I asked Kathleen in the interview I did with her for the New York Times was uh, about how, you know, I know that there's a civil military divide in this country, but I also think that there is a civil civilian divide, career civilian divide in the national security world of uh, how the, most of America does, does not understand what national security bureaucrats do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is really hurtful to our national security. And Kathleen's book has done a great job at illuminating not only just like the, the deep policy questions they have to deal with, but what happens when you forget to have take your visitor's badge to the bathroom of the Pentagon or um, you know wearing high heels in the Pentagon and now that's a really bad idea sometimes if you don't know how to walk in them and other things so I'm, I'm gr so grateful she's told this story and I hope that you can share it with all of your friends so once again thanks to all of you Damon Clem the Atlantic Council it's been a real pleasure thank you Great.